When we become a Christian, we are saying for the rest of our lives, we will follow Jesus. But if we are following someone, it means we are going somewhere. This is the most exciting, fulfilling, life-changing journey we will ever take. But it means we can't stand still. The life of a Christian is never sedentary. It's never stationary. It's not yet finished. We are a new creation, but not a complete creation. God has more in store for us, and when the goal is to be more like Jesus, we are setting a goal we will be striving toward for the rest of our lives. We'll never perfectly be like Jesus, but every day, a little bit closer than we were yesterday, we can be more like Jesus. This Christian life is an adventure greater than any other you could go on. It, it, it is an adventure of learning and growing and striving and ultimately becoming more and more like Jesus. I want to invite you to listen to these words. We'll look at this passage in a little more depth in the message, but just as we begin, just kind of quiet your heart, open your ears, and listen to these words inspired by the Holy Spirit given through the Apostle Paul to a church over 2,000 years ago in a little city called Ephesus. And he wrote these words. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers, people with certain giftings, leadings in the church, what for? To equip his people, that's us, every Christian, to equip his people for works of service so the body of Christ, his church, may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature. And become mature. Say those two words with me. Become mature. One more time. Become mature. Attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That's the goal. That you and I would attain to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Our theme for 2020, for the whole year, will be just these three words. More like Jesus. To become more like Jesus. In my 10 years, now more than 10 years of ministry here at Shoreline, we've never had a theme for the whole year. But as I was praying about this year, talking with our staff and our team and our L team, it just felt like that's where God wanted to take us as a congregation. What does it look like to become more like Jesus? If you're a brand new Christian, we had a lot of people at the end of last year make commitments to Jesus Christ. If you're a brand new Christian, what does it mean day by day to become more like Jesus in, in my attitudes, in my thinking, in my words? in my relationships, and how I forgive people or don't forgive people? What's it look like to become more like Jesus as a brand new Christian? What does it look like as a long-time mature Christian to keep becoming more like Jesus? I've discovered that the longer I'm a Christian, the more I realize I have to become more like Jesus. When I've been a Christian like four or five years, I was like in my early 20s, I was going, man, I got it. I have figured this thing out. I am just becoming like, I mean, I just, I was arrogant. I was a I just, I thought I had it all figured out. And the longer I'm a Christian, I think, I think step by step, the more mature I come, but the more I realize how far I have to go to be like Jesus. Does that make sense? That's that journey of growth when you realize there's so much to becoming like Jesus. He's so glorious and so beautiful and so good. And even if you're a person who's not a follower of Jesus yet, you say, well, I'm not even a Christian yet. I've been coming to Shoreline and I've been listening, but I'm not there yet. I hope you would say at the start of this year, as I'm trying to figure out the whole Jesus thing along the way, may I start to become more like Jesus. Start to figure out who he is and think, what would Jesus do and how would he respond and how would Jesus act in this situation? And that'll help on your journey as you're moving towards Jesus Christ. But that's our theme for this year is to become more like Jesus. Uh, Shoreline's mission statement is just 13 words. It's pretty simple. And I hope maybe this year it's 13 words. I would encourage you to commit this to memory. But here's, if somebody says, well, what, what does Shoreline Church do? What's Shoreline Church all about? Here's our mission statement to help as many people as possible become totally committed to Jesus Christ. Read that with me. You ready? To help as many people as possible become totally committed to Jesus Christ. 13 words. I would challenge you to memorize those 13 words in that order because it makes more sense if you keep in that order. Uh, to help as many people as possible become totally committed to Jesus Christ. And, and this is really an incredible journey that we're on. It's a lifetime journey. 
And theologians use two different words to talk about sort of, sort of the beginning of this journey and then this long time journey of becoming like Jesus. The first word is salvation. There's a moment for a person, for a man, a woman, a young person, if they, if they come to understand, it's not just that I go to church, it's not just that my parents went to church, it's not just that I own a Bible, it's not just that I kind of believe in some stuff about Jesus, but there's a moment of what we call salvation, where somebody says, I confess my sins, I believe Christ alone can save me, I turn away from my old way of life, I take the hand of Jesus, and I start walking with him. So we confess our sins, we receive Jesus Christ, and we're saved, we have salvation. We become born again, followers of Jesus Christ. But that's the starting point, salvation. And even if you can't name the exact day it happened and the exact moment, some people say, well, it's like in the end of my junior high years. You don't have to know the exact day or moment, just know that I came to that point where I put my faith fully in Jesus and not in myself, and I chose to follow him. That's salvation. Sanctification is the other word. Sanctification is the journey of becoming more like Jesus, the journey of spiritual growth, and that takes a lifetime. Salvation in a moment, sanctification, a lifetime. I've been on this journey of sanctification for 40 years. There's still new things I'm learning. I had a gentleman, actually, this gentleman, uh, some, some of you uh, know uh, Ray and Kathleen, but Ray, uh, he passed away on New Year's Day He's part of this church. He had kind of a motorized cart he was in uh, here, and he was here, here faithfully. But a couple weeks ago during the Christmas series, he caught me after the service, and he said, Pastor, I want to share something. And he shared an insight from the sermon. He said, I never thought of it that way. I never really learned that before. And he was just sharing how God was teaching him new things. Ray was in his 70s. But he was saying, I'm still learning about what it means to become more like Jesus, to follow him. And so this, this is the journey we're on, and I think it's the most exciting journey of all. But here's the challenge. Growth, it's complicated. This, this journey of spiritual growth is complicated. Every, any area of growth is complicated. Think about a little baby. A little baby's born. And you look at that little baby and you say, okay, hi, baby. Uh, here's my exhortation. Grow up. Have a great life. And you just leave that kid alone and let, it figure, let the kid figure it out, Right? No, growth is complicated. Your help, if you're a parent, a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle, a neighbor, a friend, a family with a little one, we're, we're, it's, it's diapers being changed. It's, it's physical care. It's emotional learning. It's relational teaching. It's a thousand moments, thousands and thousands of moments of teaching. It's complicated to see a little child grow up into a healthy grown-up. Growth is just that way. It's complicated. When we, were, when we Sherry and I became parents, um, over 30 years ago now, with our first son, he was, he was a certain kind of learner. At Christmas time, he, he was just a little guy still, but Sherry was teaching him colors. So she used the Christmas tree lights to teach him colors. She, goes, she says, Zach, you know, this is green, this is blue. This. She went through a couple, you know, just did some basic teaching, and he got it. And he, you know, which one's this? And he could, she could say it, he'd point to it. He got it that fast. So that, that growth is easy, right? Well, then our next son comes along. He's about the same age at a Christmas a couple years later, and Sherry's doing the exact same thing. And he's not responding the same, and he's not getting it the same. And Sherry, and Sherry said something. She's like, God, boy, boy, maybe he just learns differently. Or maybe he learns more slowly or something. Oh, I said, no, no, I just don't think he learns that way. He, he's not a linear learner. And, he's, and, and my first son is now in financial management. And my second son is now an artist. He owns a video company. And he does, he does wedding videos and different videos. And you know, they, they were showing us at that young age, they learn differently. So it's not only complicated, but every single situation. So think, now, now put this in the mix. Spiritual growth. Becoming more like Jesus. Oh, it's easy. You become a Christian, come to church occasionally, own a Bible, and you're mature. Right? No. It's a journey. It's climbing. It's striving. It's struggling. It's pressing forward. And here's my invitation for 2020. I want to invite you to say to God today, oh, Lord, I want to be more like Jesus. I want to go on this journey I want to be led by the Holy Spirit in the community of God's people. And I want to invite you to, to commit for the next 51 weeks to either be here or, if you're out of town, follow the message online on your, on your Shoreland app, on your phone, or on your computer, and walk this journey for 52 weeks. Lord, that's our prayer today, that we would become more like Jesus. And I pray each one of us, whether it's a new believer a longtime follower of Jesus, or maybe somebody who's still investigating the Christian faith, by the time we get to the end of this year, we will say, I know Jesus, and I am more like Jesus than I've ever been before. Lead us on this journey. We pray this in his name. Amen. Well, this journey really involves kind of four uh, big epic things. And, and first I want to ask the question, what is the call, the mission, the focus of a life following Jesus, following Jesus, becoming more like Jesus, this journey of spiritual growth? 
What is it all about? And I'm going to suggest today that there's really four elements. And if you're a note taker, you'll find your bullets in a place to write a few notes down. If you listen and kind of learn better by listening, that's fine. But if you want to write some notes down, there's a space for this. But I want to give you four kind of big concepts that are going to guide us through the whole year. And they're going to guide us through learning from, from we're going to be doing a study in the book of Nehemiah. We're going to be doing it, looking at different elements of our spiritual growth. But, but we're going to be growing through the whole year. And there's four elements that guide this whole process. And so here's the first big lesson number one or element number one of this spiritual journey. And I call it, it's the element of direction. There's really three epic directions on this journey. And here it is, to journey upward in worship. If you're going to walk with Jesus, follow Jesus, and become more like Jesus, you say, well, which, which way am I heading on this journey? One direction is upward. I'm going to go upward and worship. I want to worship him more, love him more, seek his face more, give him praise and glory. And upward, it's an upward journey. But second, it's an inward journey. To journey inward. To go deeper in community with God's people, deeper in love with Jesus. We call that discipleship. We're becoming more like him. So the spiritual growth and learning that we're moving inward in fellowship and community and in spiritual growth closer to Jesus. So upward in worship, inward in spiritual growth and discipleship. And then it's a journey outward with the love of Jesus, with the grace of Jesus, bringing that love to the world who so needs to know there is a God who cares about them, who came to meet them and to bring them back to himself. So if you say, well, what's, what's the direction of this spirit? If, if I'm going to be on the spiritual journey, what's it look like? It means day in and day out, I'm moving upward in worship, inward in discipleship, and outward in sharing the love of Jesus. In my home, in my neighborhood, I'm saying, God, this day, how do I worship you? How do I grow in my faith? And how do I share the love of Jesus with others? Upward, inward, outward. At your school, in your workplace, in social settings. Oh, God, how do I, in this setting, know that I'm looking to you and worshiping you, knowing that I'm growing deeper in faith and love with you, and knowing that I'm going out and sharing your love and your grace with others? Upward, inward, outward. Every day in every environment of our lives, it's complicated. But that's what we're going to be talking about. This journey upward, inward, and outward. That's a big theme we'll be talking about throughout this year. And you'll, and you'll hear us talking about this. Big lesson number two, or theme number two. It's what I call the heartbeat, or kind of the guidelines of this journey. How does the fruit of the Spirit guide our spiritual journey? I believe if we're going to go upward, inward, and outward and live this life of faith, if we're going to become more and more like Jesus, the Spirit of God needs to fill our hearts more and more, and the fruit of the Spirit needs to grow in us and needs to guide us. I'll explain why in just a minute, but let me, let me just remind you, if you don't know the passage, Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23, inspired by the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul writes these words, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are internal things that are happening in us. While we're walking with Jesus, while we're growing in faith, while we're, taking, when, while, while we're on this journey following Jesus, we need the fruit of the Spirit to guide us because we're going to get derailed if the Spirit of God's not guiding us. So how does the fruit of the Spirit guide our spiritual journey? Let me share three thoughts with you. I think these are very important. First, the fruit of the Spirit protects us from pride. It protects us from becoming arrogant. It protects us from saying, hey, you know, I read my Bible, and I pray 10 minutes a day, and I go to church every Sunday. I'm better than you. You don't read your Bible every day? Shame on you. You're not, I mean, nobody's going to say it that well. Hopefully nobody would say it that way, but we think that. And if the fruit of the Spirit, if love and joy and peace, patience, forbearance, gentleness, self, if these things aren't in us, what happens is we start getting on this journey of growth where we're saying, well, I do this, and I do this, and I'm following the rules, I'm following the regulations, I'm doing all the religious stuff, and, and then all of a sudden become arrogant. Look at me. We become what Jesus bumped to in his day in the first century, Pharisees. The Pharisees followed all the rules and all the regulations, but their hearts were not close to God. So the fruit of the Spirit protects us from that kind of pride. Also, the fruit of the Spirit uh, keep, keeps us focused on Jesus. When the Spirit of God is in us, and when love and joy and peace, and these things are growing in us, it doesn't become about us. Our eyes are fixed on Jesus. The, the, the book of Hebrews says, the author, the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. We keep our eyes on Jesus. We keep our eyes on Jesus. And the fruit of the Spirit keeps our heart in the right place so it doesn't become about me. 
It becomes about Jesus. We need the fruit of the Spirit alive in our hearts. Also, the fruit of the Spirit becomes a barrier to legalism. It is really easy for legalism to take over, especially when we start growing in some of the spiritual disciplines, when we start taking some of those practices of the Christian life and start living into them. So when I became a Christian, I became a Christian in a great church in a wonderful youth group, but there was some legalism going on. I mean, when I became a Christian, I knew what you had to do to be a good Christian every day. I knew. You had to read your Bible for 15, 15 minutes. I knew it, 15 minutes. Any less than that, not a good Christian. I knew you had to pray and write some prayers down in your prayer journal. I knew you had to go to youth group every week. I knew that, I mean, there was certain things I knew you had to do and not do. And if you follow those things, I, you knew you were a good Christian. So any day that I did all the checklist things from the youth group I was part of, I felt good about my faith. But you know what happened when I, if I missed reading my Bible one day? I was a bad Christian. I was a bad person. I just, I, I knew it because that's what I, I kind of, that's what I've been taught. It became this legalism. Do this, 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 this. Don't do this, 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 this. You're in the club. And then if somebody else doesn't do this, 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 or they, or, or they fail to do this, 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 then they're bad and they're out of the club. That's legalism. That's not the heart of Jesus. And so the fruit of the Spirit, when we love people, when we understand his love for us. See, see I had days, as probably the first four or five years I was a Christian, where I knew I was a bad Christian because I hadn't followed all the rules that I was supposed to follow. And I thought God stopped loving me on those days. That's legalism. I know now that his grace is sufficient for me and he loves me wherever I'm at. Now, he delights when I'm growing. He loves that. But he doesn't stop loving me. It's not like every single day, up, down, up, down, up, down, depending on me following the rules and regulations. And when you know the love of Jesus, you want to grow in faith. You want to become like him. So the, so the fruit of the Spirit help protect us from that kind of legalism. So, big lesson number one, our direction, we're, we're going upward in worship, inward in discipleship, and outward with the gospel. Big truth number two we're going to be talking about all year long is we have to let the fruit of the Spirit grow in us so that our growth stays healthy and we don't become prideful and legalistic. Here's the third big lesson. It's around the spiritual markers. What does it look like when I'm growing in spiritual maturity? How do I know when I'm growing? How do I know if I'm on that journey and I'm taking steps forward? And really what it comes down to is living the kind of life Jesus lived and following the teachings of God's word. And this is why the Holy Spirit needs to be present and the fruit of the Spirit needs to be there because if we follow on these steps and we're not being humble... It, it become, becomes legalistic. And so uh, what I want to do is I want to think about what does it mean to be growing up in faith? And we actually took time here at Shoreline for about a year and a half. We spent with our, some of our children's leaders, youth leaders, women's leaders, uh, adult leaders, different leaders in our church, looking at the scriptures and saying, what are the primary markers or behaviors of a growing mature Christian? Because the Bible lays those out for us. And we grappled with this for a long time. We prayed and we came up with what you see in the middle of the screen there. Uh, each of those icons represents one of the markers. I'll get to that in just a minute. But, but we came up with seven areas of ongoing spiritual growth that are just so central in God's word that you know that, that if you're going upward, inward, and outward, and you're filled with the Holy Spirit and guided by the, you know, guided by the Spirit, then as you live into these things, they propel you forward in spiritual growth. And so before we look at this, I want to read the Ephesians passage I started our time with and just listen again to these words from Ephesians 4.11 and following. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ, the whole church, each of you, each of us, may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and unity in the knowledge of the Son of God and become, and here's the key, mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That's the goal, to attain to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Are you there yet? Are you fully mature in Christ? And I know the answer. None of us are there yet. We're still on that journey, but it's an amazing journey. And so... Uh, I want to look at these seven markers you see up behind me. You know, what does it look like when I'm growing in spiritual maturity? And I want to look at these and talk about these together because each of those represents a different aspect of the biblical model of growing in our faith. And I'll hit them really quickly for you, then we'll walk through them one at a time. So if you look up there at 12 o'clock, if that's the clock at 12 o'clock at the top, that's biblical engagement. You want to know you're growing in your faith? Be engaged in the scriptures. 
I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Next to it, the two voice bubbles talking to each other, that's passionate prayer. God's talking to us, we're talking to him. That's part of growing in spiritual maturity. Biblical engagement, passionate prayer. The hands with the heart being lifted up, that's wholehearted worship. That we're worshipers of the living God. The hand helping the hand is humble service. We're like Jesus washing the disciples' feet. We're taking hands, we're serving people, we're caring for them. And then the hand with the heart. You know what Jesus said? Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's taking all we have our time, our abilities, and our financial resources, and we're offering them to the Lord. That's joyful generosity. Not just doing it, but doing it joyfully. And then the little ceiling with the three people, that's consistent community. Being with God's people together is part of the journey of spiritual growth. And then the lighthouse, that's organic outreach, naturally sharing our faith and the love of Jesus. Now, let me tell you something about those seven markers of spiritual maturity. They're not about legalism. They're about a pathway for spiritual growth. And... That is not a menu, that is a recipe. There's a difference. It's not a menu, it's a recipe. Here's what you do with a menu. You go to a restaurant and you go, I'll pick the what I like. So maybe you got the pick three, there's 15 things, pick three. So you go, okay, I'm gonna t- I like biblical engagement, I like worship, and I like serving. I'll pick those three, and I don't do the other four. That's a menu mindset. A recipe says you need all the ingredients. If you have a recipe that has seven ingredients and you only use three, what do you have? I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is, but it's not what you're trying to cook, right? It's not a menu, pick two or three. It's a recipe. I need all of them. And listen closely. If you have a recipe, and here's what I'm going to suggest as I walk through these. For every person here, there'll be two or three of them that you'll probably go, yeah, I'm pretty good at that one. I'm pre- that comes pretty naturally for me. There'll be one or two or three that you'll go, yeah, that's harder for me. I don't even like that one. All right? So if, you're, if you've got a recipe and you've got three or four of the elements, what should you do? Add to what you're cooking the elements you don't have yet. So here's my challenge as I walk through this and as we walk through this year. That you not look at the markers of maturity that, that fit you best, that you like the best, and that you do easiest. And say, I'm going to do more of that. But you look and say, what are the elements of the recipe that are missing in my life? And what are the one or two that I need to really this year Make sure it's part of who I am to help me really become more like Jesus and grow in maturity. So let's look at these different elements, a part of this recipe of our spiritual growth. Biblical engagement. It's just this reality that God wants us to love and to know and to read and to listen to and to meditate and to follow his word. If you want to know you're growing in spiritual maturity, you got to get to know this book better. Even if you know it really well you got to get to know it better and follow what it says and fall in love with what God is teaching you and the God who gave you this book. That's part of the journey. I want to challenge you, if this isn't part of your life, if this is part of the recipe of your spiritual journey, that you would get into God's word. And we're going to give you lots of ways to do it in the coming year. I do want to give you two fun invitations. I am going to be doing a thing this year with anybody in the congregation who wants to make a commitment this year to memorize at least one full chapter of the Bible or more, to go on a journey with me. I've got a goal for myself, but you could pick, and you could pick Psalm 23, you could pick uh, 1 Corinthians 13, you know, the love chapter, it's really about spiritual gifts. You could you know, pick a chapter and commit it word, as best you can, word for word to memory, so it's locked in your mind and locked in your heart. If you want to do that, or here's my second challenge. If anybody wants to join a book club with me, I'm going to do a book club this year, and I'm not going to tell you what books are, we're going to do at least three or four books, all that will help you in your spiritual life and spiritual growth, if you're interested, and we'll meet once, I'll, I'll announce as we go through the year when the book club's going on, when we're going to meet to talk about what we've learned. So Bible memory, pro- process at least a chapter or more, or the book club. If you want to be part of that, just on the back of the bulletin is my email address, just kevin at shoreline.church, or go to the Connection Center and just say, hey, and they got a check for you, you can, put, you can put Bible memory, book club, or both. Give us your name, contact information. All you're saying is, I want to know more to find out if I want to be part of this. It's not a commitment to be there, but if 20 people or 200 people say, I want to be part of it. I'm thrilled about this. And I want to walk through this together. And I want to dig into God's word and learn what it means to walk with Jesus. But biblical engagement, this is part of our journey of spiritual growth. And so consider that. Next, passionate prayer. Passionate prayer that we've got to learn. If if you want to, how do I know I'm growing in Christian maturity? I'm talking to God more. I'm sharing, I'm confessing my sins. I'm lifting up my praise. I'm thanking him for his goodness. I'm lifting up my needs and the needs of those I love. I'm quieting my heart for that still small voice to let God whisper and speak to me and guide my life. I'm communicating with God. That's part of spiritual maturity. It's built into it. Maybe that's an area you need to grow in the coming year. Uh, Then wholehearted worship. 
This is being a person who just, you just throw your heart and yourself into worship corporately when we're together like this, individually when you're driving in the car and you just want to sing praise to God and celebrate him or declare his greatness and his glory, but you say, I want to grow as a passionate worshiper. That may be an area God wants you to grow this year. Humble service, finding your place to serve in your home, in your neighborhood, in your workplace, at the church, wherever you are. Being the kind of person that when something comes up, you're the first one to say, can I help? Can I give you a hand with that? Hey, what do you need right now? Can I step in there? To have the heart of Jesus to humbly serve. Jesus washed the feet of the disciples. The passage there, uh, John 13, it's about Jesus washing the disciples' feet and calling us to live that way. Humble service. It's part of our mature uh, journey of maturity as Christians. Joyful generosity. Being in a place where you say, my time my abilities and my resources, they belong to Jesus. I hold them in an open hand. My heart and, and, and where your treasure is, there your heart is, everything I have, I lift it to the Lord. And here's the trick. It's joyful generosity. The Bible's clear about this. Not just that I'm generous, but I'm glad I can be generous. That's joyful generosity. Does God want to grow you in that area on your spiritual journey? Consistent community. There are some people that just say, I don't like being around People a lot. I don't like being around, I don't like, I like being a Christian. I just don't like being around Christians a whole lot. And they kind of push away from Christian community. But we're going to help you learn what it looks like to really connect with God's people, to be part of his body and connected with the church of Jesus Christ. Does that need to be part of your journey? Organic outreach. Finding natural ways to share your faith. To pray for people that don't know Jesus. To pray with people who don't know Jesus to share your story of your journey to Jesus or your story of how God's just working in your life last week, to share his story of salvation. That's part of the journey of every single Christian. These, these markers of maturity that you see up there, it's not a menu that you choose a couple from. It is a recipe. And for each one of us, there's elements where we're going, I don't have enough of that in my life. Let this be the year you pay attention to that. Now, some of you are like, well, how do I know? How can I discern where I am in this spiritual journey. We have actually designed and created here at Shoreline a self-assessment. It's on your Shoreline app. It's on the computer. And if you don't have a, a phone that works that way or a computer, we can give you a hard copy of that at the Connection Center. Or get on a list and we'll make sure we get that to you. It's a, it's a tool that you use that you go through. And as a matter of fact, you can see it on our website right there. And you open the website. If you click there, you get this. And all you do is you read the question and you, you either click never true of me, rarely true of me, occasionally true of me, often true of me, always true of me. Same thing, you just read the question, you click one of those bubbles, at the end, you hit send, and in about three seconds, you have a whole assessment of where you're at and ways you can start growing in each area. We've created that here just to serve you that way. And, and nobody will know whose results are whose, it doesn't come to anybody, unless you click one button, and you see it at the bottom, and say, I wanna meet with somebody and talk about this. And here's what we're committed to do. If you click on that, the results will come back to you and they'll come to one person at the church who will contact you and sit with you and help you personally design a pathway for your spiritual growth in some areas you want to grow in. I don't know a lot of churches in the world that say we'll sit with anybody and help them personally design their own you know, pathway to help them in their own unique area of needed growth, but we want to do that for anyone who's willing to do that. So that's on the website. It's there available for you. And again, if you don't have a computer, check in the Connection Center and we'll get you a hard copy and we'll walk with, with you through that and help you move forward. But, but those markers of growth, and again, as you start growing in biblical engagement and in passionate prayer and wholehearted worship, it's not so to go, woo, look at me, I'm a Pharisee, I'm so good. It's to say, I'm becoming more like Jesus. I'm following God's path for spiritual growth. And then the fourth and final concept, the fourth and final big lesson is really around how we need to walk in community in our spiritual journey. Here's the question. Is it okay for me to walk with Jesus on my own and not connect with others? Is it okay for me to say, I love Jesus, I want to walk with him, but I don't really want to be around you other Christians? Is that a biblical model? Well, listen to these words from 1 Corinthians 12, beginning in verse 12. Just as a body, physical body, though one, has many parts... And all of its parts form one body, just as the physical body has lots of parts, but they're all one body, so it is with Christ spiritually. We're connected to each other. For we were all baptized by one spirit. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body that we're united together. Listen, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, those are the most different groups in the ancient world. And he says they can come together and become one. We were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so... 
the body, the church, is not made up of one part, but of many. And the Apostle Paul goes on to say, you can't say you're not needed. You can't say they're not needed. He goes on to say, we rejoice together and we sorrow together. We're bound together. And that's the picture. When we follow Jesus, we don't follow him alone or we will not grow into full Christian maturity. We won't become more and more like Jesus like we could unless we're in community. And so what are the four generations of discipleship? Why? These are, we need at least four people bound together. And I love this graphic you're going to see up on the center screen here of people climbing together. And so go to the next graphic on the center screen. There. Yeah, so there's people climbing together and this idea of locking hands and going together because you know, there are people that do solo free climbing. You know, people that climb cliffs and mountains by themselves, some with ropes for support and safety, some without. But most of the people who, have, who do a lot of solo climbing, solo free climbing, have a relatively short career. Anybody want to guess why? <laughs> You've answered my question. That it's funny. Uh, but, but they die. They die. Why? They're alone. They get stuck on a mountain. They get stuck on the side of a mountain. A storm comes in. There's no one there to help them. Or they're doing, you know, they're alone. But there's strength and safety in traveling together. So, so the Apostle Paul addresses this in 2 Timothy 2.2. This little verse shows these kind of four generations of how we walk together in faith. And Paul says to Timothy, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Here's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, Timothy, here, here I am, Paul. I've been part of your life. And I've been pouring into your life and investing in you spiritually. I've taken your hand spiritually and helped you grow. So now you, Timothy, second generation, are growing in your faith. Because somebody's pouring into you, Paul is. But Paul says, but Timothy, you find some reliable people and you pour into their life and you help them grow in faith. So now Timothy is now helping someone else grow in faith. But, but Paul says to Timothy, when you pour into these people, make sure they're able to pour into others also. Fourth generation. You get the picture? So here's our spiritual life. Here's you and me. Here's me. Here's Kevin. I'm a new Christian. And Doug Drainville and Glenn Perry, some other young college guys, poured into my life. Help me grow in faith. They said, now, Kevin, now you're growing in faith, but the best way to grow in biblical engagement, the best way to grow in passionate prayer is to pour into somebody else to help them grow in biblical engagement, passionate prayer. You help them grow so well that they can help somebody else grow. One, two, three, four generations. That's a recipe for spiritual growth. That's what God wants. Growth is complicated. This journey is glorious, but we need each other. And so, Lord, our prayer is this. As we walk into 2020, would you meet with us in fresh new ways? May we each become more and more and more like Jesus. May we go upward and inward and outward. May we be guided by, by the fruit of the Holy Spirit of God. May each of these markers grow in our lives, particularly the ones that we're just not that strong in. And Lord, may we do it in community not only being helped by others to grow, but us investing in others who in turn invest in others. And through all of this, may you be glorified in the lives of your people. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.